Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, we continue talking about limits, limits of the functions in this particular case, sequences we have already covered. So these are limits of the functions. Um, this lecture, as you know, is part of the course of advanced mathematics for teenagers and uh, high school students. It's presented on unizor.com. I do recommend you to watch this lecture from this website because it has notes, very detailed notes for each lecture, including this one. Um, also, registered students can take exams, and this is a very good way to check how you basically master the material. Um, the site is free, so... All right. Um, now, today I'm going to talk about two definitions which uh, I have presented in the previous lecture, two definitions of the concept of a function limit. Mm -hmm. Now, um, first of all, there are certain historical uh, motivations for having these two separate definitions. Let me just remind you very briefly what they are. So if you have a function, let's um, have it graphically. This is my function. Now this is some particular value, r, and um, we are talking about function uh, converging to some value a as x converges to r. So let's just take for instance x1, x2, x3, etc. They are all converging to the r and these are corresponding values of f at x1, f at x2, etc. And this is supposed to be a. So as x converges to r, function is converging to the value a. That is basically illustration of what the function limit actually is. And I have, I have suggested two different definitions. One definition is the following. If for any sequence x1, x2, x3, etc. converging to r, any, any is a very, very important words right now. So if for any such sequence of arguments converging to r, corresponding any. This is the mathematical symbol for, for any. If for any the corresponding value of the function is a sequence which is converging to A, then A is a limit of the function f at x at point, at point r. And this limit is equal to A. Another definition, now by the way, the, the, the good thing about this definition is that it's very, uh, I would say, human-like. It's, it, it's nature. I mean, you see immediately that, well, the x is moving to, towards r, f is supposed to move towards a, and that seems to be corresponding to our intuitive understanding of what actually the limit is. And this important uh, um, detail about any sequence which converges to R should really cause the corresponding sequence of the function values to converge to A. This is a very important thing because sometimes you can have functions, and I gave you an example, that if you go by rational numbers, for instance, to the, towards R, function might take the value, let's say, 0. On irrational, it takes the value 1. So it looks like there is no limit, basically, in this case. But nevertheless, um, you have argument converging either uh, by rational or by irrational um, numbers to the same R. So if, and, and we cannot obviously say that in that particular case function has a limit, but if for any sequence converging to R of the arguments, my functions converge to A, then we can say that the function has a limit and its limit is equal to A. Another, 
Oh yes, that that's the positive thing. I forgot about negative. What's negative about this particular um, definition? Well, the negative is that how can I check that the function really has the limit based on this definition? Well, I have to go through all the different sequences of argument converging to R. But how can I uh, check for all the sequences? It's, it, it's impossible. Uh, there is an infinite number of sequences, obviously, which R converge to R. So I can't really constructively check the uh, existence of the, of the limit. I cannot prove that function has a limit because I cannot really exhaust all the sequences of the arguments which are converging to R. So there is another definition. It's not as as human-like. It's not as natural as far as you know what we intuitively think about this. However, it's perfectly correct, and uh, and it's equivalent to this one. And this is an equivalency equivalency which I'm going to prove today. So let me remind you the second one. Now the second one is if. I would like to be as close on my function as possible to the fu to, to the value a. So for any degree of closeness epsilon positive, however small, there should be there should exist. So for any epsilon should exist delta such that as soon as my argument is within delta from limit point immediately following from this my function would be close to the limit than this particular value epsilon. This is not as obvious as this one. However, it's also correct and let me just try to explain it a little bit more over and beyond whatever I did in the previous lecture. Now, this signifies the closeness of the argument to the R. Any kind of argument, as long as it's within delta neighborhood, as we are saying. So, within very, very small. So, for any Del, uh, for any epsilon neighborhood of A, so if I would like my function to be from A minus epsilon to A plus epsilon, somewhere here, there is always such a range of argument where this is true. And then I can make this um, smaller by vertical, so epsilon gets smaller. And then for a smaller, I still have to find an, a, 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 a delta neighborhood of my R where all the values of the functions will be within this smaller uh, neighborhood. So no matter how small a neighborhood I do, I, I, I would like to, to, to really be. Uh, I would like to be as close to a as possible, measuring, is, measuring it by, by epsilon. For any measure, I will find certain degree of closeness to uh, the R, so whenever my argument is very close to the R, my function will be within this narrow interval around, around A. So this is my other definition. And today I'm going to prove that these definitions are equivalent, which means if this function has limit A as X goes to R according to one definition, then it's actually the same limit with the same condition according to another definition and vice versa. So that's what I'm going to prove right now. Okay? All right. Now, before starting this proof, I would like to mention something very important. Um, I would like to I would like to recommend you to try to prove it yourself um, before actually listening to my explanation. Uh, whether you will be successful or unsuccessful doesn't really matter as long as you spend some time thinking about how to prove from one 
to another or from that other to the first one. Um, it's very it's it's very useful exercise for you, and you know the whole purpose of this course is to basically um, convince you that this kind of a mathematics is, is really necessary for for your creativity, for your development of your logical thinking, your analytics, etc. It's not the purpose of just giving a certain amount of information. Nobody needs the proof. I mean, every, everybody knows that this, these are two equivalent uh, definitions. So why do we prove it? Well, it's an excellent school of thought for you. So I would rather recommend you to stop this video if you didn't do it before. Stop this video. Go to um, explanation on unisor.com uh, of these two theorems. And there are proofs that as well. Don't read the proofs, try to prove it yourself. Then, again, after you spend at least an hour, that's what I would suggest, um, you, you can read whatever, whatever is, is written there, then you can listen to me, and uh, when everything is finished, I do recommend you to try again. Just do it by yourself, from the memory, whatever you have remembered from my explanation, or from reading the, the website. Okay, now I will go. So the first one is, I would like to prove that if my, so my first definition is the following. If my xn uh, converges to R, and for any such um, sequence of xn, if this is uh, any sequence which is converging to R, if from this follows that my functions of these arguments represent a sequence which is converging to A, then the limit of the function is A. So let's consider that this function has limit A, which means that this is true. What I would like to prove is that for any epsilon greater than zero, there is such a delta that as long as my x is uh, in delta neighborhood from R, my function would be within epsilon neighborhood of A. So, this is given, this is a true statement, and this I have to prove. By the way, sometimes people are saying strictly less here and here. It doesn't really matter. For definition, it doesn't really. Both are completely equivalent of this. All right, so how can I prove that? All right. Um, let's assume that this is not true. What does it mean that this is not true? Well, it means that for some particular epsilon there is no, there is no such delta. Right? Now, what does it mean that there is no such delta? It means that whatever value of delta I can choose, doesn't really matter which one. From this, this does not follow. So, the, I, I chose some particular, so I'm negating this. So, from some particular value of epsilon, there is no such delta that this is true. What does it mean that there is no such, 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 such delta? It means that no matter what kind of delta I choose, if my x would be closer than this delta, my function would not be within this particular epsilon neighborhood. My function would be outside the neighborhood. So, I choose one particular epsilon. I put it as epsilon zeros, doesn't really matter. So, there is no 
such delta that this is true which means that no matter what delta I choose if this is true this is false all right okay fine so let's choose delta equals to 1 delta first equals to 1 and I choose one particular x which is closer than 1 to r I find this x1 and for this particular x1 I know that f of uh, f, f of f, f of x minus a greater than epsilon now I will choose another delta one half and choose x2 within one half of the r still now this is f of x1 this is f of x2 also would be greater than epsilon delta 3 I will choose one third and x3 is within one third from the r and I know that my f of x3 is still greater than epsilon etc so my delta nth is equal to 1 nth I, I choose xn which is within 1 nth from r and then still my f at xn so what do I have right now I have a sequence of x1, x2, x3, xn etc which is converging to r which is this is true right since my difference is less than one less than two one half less than one third less than one nth so obviously the difference between uh, xn and r is uh, infinitesimal my function is still outside of the uh, epsilon uh, neighborhood around a so I have actually constructed a sequence of arguments which are going to R for which values of the functions do not converge to A because the difference between them and A is still greater than something so they, they do not converge so it's contradiction with my premise that any sequence, you see, this is what's important about this any I said that any sequence of the argument which goes to R results in the se in sequence of arguments uh, of, of the function which is uh, converging to A and now I'm explicitly constructing one particular sequence that this is not true what does it mean? that my initial negation of this leads to the contradiction with my premise so my initial negation is wrong which means that this is true and that's the proof basically that's the end of the proof there is no such epsilon for which something like this is happening so for all epsilon as long as my um, there is always some kind of a delta uh, where uh, closeness to the argument to the limit point results in the closeness of the function all right well that's one thing that's the proof from the first definition to the second now let's try to do it the other way around so this is given and this is what we have to prove right okay fine we have to prove this for any sequence right sequence of arguments well let's take the sequence of arguments any sequence of arguments you see this any I just took any sequence of arguments which is converging to R now what happens then now I know that my um, as long as my 
uh, um, sequence converges to R, uh, there is, for any delta, there is always some number n, after which, as long as n greater than n, my xn minus r greater than or less than or equal to, to, to delta. Right? That's what it means. Convergence to r means that whatever the degree of closeness I choose, after a certain number of, uh, of n, all my members of my sequence will be within the delta um, neighborhood from, from r. That's what it means, right? That's basically, that's what given when I'm saying let's take any particular sequence which goes to r. Okay? Now, what I do have to prove is that the corresponding sequence of functions of these xn. That's what I have to prove. Now, what does it mean that I have to prove it? I have to prove that for any epsilon there is always some number n such that as long as n greater than n or equal from this follows my function minus a would be less than epsilon, right? So let me choose one particular one particular value of um, of delta. Now I have this. Now, for any epsilon, for any epsilon, so I can choose this one. I can find such a delta that this is true, right? Because this is my premise of this particular theorem. So, from this epsilon, I can always find delta. Now, from the delta, I can find number n when this is true. So what happens? It means that no matter what kind of epsilon I choose, no matter what kind of epsilon I choose, based on this, I can find delta, because that's what basically this definition states, that if the function has limit of a, it means that for any epsilon there is a delta such that it, as long as your argument is within delta neighborhood, my function will be within epsilon neighborhood. So, for any epsilon, I can find my delta. Now, from delta, I can find number n, because I know that this is uh, converging to r. So, for all these numbers n, my x would be within this neighborhood. So, from this follows this, which means this will be within the epsilon neighborhood. And that's basically it. So, let me just try to maybe say it slightly differently. Because, again, what do I have to prove? I have to prove that for any epsilon there is some kind of a number when this function would be in the epsilon neighborhood from the A. But for any epsilon, including whatever I choose, I can always find delta, and based on this definition, I can find the delta neighborhood of R, where my uh, argument should be to necessitate this. And since my x is converging to R, I can always, by this delta, I can always find n after which all my members, including these ones, would be uh, within delta and this would be within epsilon, there, therefore. So that's my proof from this more constructive way, the one which is, I would say, more intuitive but less constructive. 
Okay, I hope I explained it in a relatively understandable terms. Um, if still it's not exactly what, 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 what you would prefer, go to this unizor.com and read the explanation as it is written. The proofs are written over there. If you still do not understand it, send me an email and I'll try to personally explain maybe in writing again something which is not really clear. But in any case, it's very important uh, for you to, to really think about both proofs because it's excellent exercise in logic. Because here you have some logical statement. Uh, for the first proof, I had to negate that statement. And there are a little bit more complicated maybe than you're used to um, logical considerations here. So that's why I would like you, you really to spend some time on this. It's much more useful to spend time thinking about this than to memorize formulas or whatever else. It's very important to understand completely how these both logical conclusions can be derived one from another and backwards. So these two uh, definitions are equivalent. If you, will feel, if you feel comfortable about these proofs, I, I guarantee that all other things related to derivatives will probably go very, very smoothly for you. All right, that's it. Thanks very much and good luck.